Welcome to, for joining the webinar hosted by Pine Financial Group. We do this webinar monthly. We always try to cover something that is pertinent to your business, never sell you anything, just give you good, valuable information to help you grow your real estate business. Pine Financial Group is Colorado, Minnesota's premier hard money lender. We've been making loans for over nine years. Um, we've done over a thousand deals. Uh, and we lend up and down the front range in Colorado and in the Twin Cities in the Minnesota market. Typically have a national audience on these calls, um, so we'll try to kind of cover, cover things that are more 30,000 foot view rather than diving into details of specific neighborhoods and areas. But some of the examples uh, in the presentation you might notice if you're in one of those markets, you might uh, recognize it. So my name is Travis Spear. I'm with Pine Fan financial group. I've been making hard money loans since 2009. Uh, that's when I got into real estate investing and uh, I started doing some fix and flips and then I uh, went from that to start buying rental property using hard money uh, with the buy, fix and refinance strategy. Um, I, I learned pretty quickly that I really enjoyed rental property so I was buying as many as I could because I really enjoyed collecting that rent, the passive income and the way that you can grow your net worth especially with the, what the market's been doing. Um, we'll jump into this present presentation we're going to cover uh, some things in, in pretty good detail uh, other items may kind of leave you uh, yearning for more and if that's the case let's talk let's connect and let, let me know what I can do to help you so thank you for joining us and uh, look forward to a good webinar here so this is me that's that's Travis Spear this is the guy presenting to you so if you're on the other side of a computer somewhere and have no idea um, I'm even wearing the same shirt today just to make it comfortable for everyone so uh, thanks for joining a little bit about me, try to share this with you so that you uh, give me a little bit of street cred and you feel like uh, the person sharing the information with you is qualified to do so. I got my real estate license in 2008 shortly after graduating college. Um, I ultimately let it go in 2013, I believe. Um, I just wasn't keeping up as much as I should and I wasn't, it wasn't the focus of my business, I wasn't doing transactions uh, for buying sale it was uh, investing so I didn't find that it was a great fit for me I started doing hard money loans in 2009 as I mentioned been a part of a lot of deals I did a handful of fix and flips as I already shared with you um, until I decided I enjoyed a rental property better I've got 12 rental properties in and around the Denver area uh, really having a lot of fun with those I'm looking at uh, buying a few more this year maybe doing another reverse 1031 exchange I look at three or more appraisals a week, so I feel like I'm pretty hip to how uh, property is valued, the details, how the adjustments are made, etc. Um, I've been involved in over 400 deals in that time, uh, whether as buyer, seller, landlord, uh, investor, hard money lender. Uh, so I've been involved in a lot of deals and, and I've seen a lot, and maybe not everything, but I've seen quite a bit, and I'd like to share those experiences with you. This is a project that just finished uh, it was last year actually it was late 2015 we took this corner lot here uh, this is what the rendering was going to be or, or what it was going to uh, be when it was completed and I think we got pretty close to that um, and this was the the end product this is in the Sloan's Lake neighborhood in Denver uh, it was a good project we did well on it um, and just some of the things you know as you kind of go through this presentation you'll learn uh, how do you value these different type of properties and things if you're going ground up. Uh, here's a, a project that I'm working on right now uh, in Denver just south of the Sloan's Lake area. Um, this is the rendering here. We're probably we should be done in June probably. Uh, we're just starting to pre-sell some units and uh, looking forward to, a, to another successful project. So the new construction has been fun. I told you I'd done some flips. I really enjoyed rentals but as the market really started to heat up uh, here in Denver had a little bit of extra cash and wasn't looking to buy rentals because of the, how fast the prices were going up. Uh, so I did a couple new construction projects and uh, in the meantime continued to buy rentals. It just took me a little time to understand what was going on. So sometimes the uh, as I click through there, there's going to be a tad bit of lag between the slide and, and what you're hearing. So if something's not making sense just give it a few seconds and you'll see it pop up. So really there's there's five ways to value property and these are the things that we're going to cover in the presentation. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is the automated valuation model. This would be like a, a Zillow or something like that where you go punch in an address and then it kicks you out um, a value. And then uh, we have the CMA which is the competitive market analysis. This is what a, an agent or somebody might put together for you. you. Might have three to five comps showing the value of a property, trying to dial in on what the differences are and that kind of thing. A BPO takes that one step further. We call it a bright, uh, broker price opinion. And what this is, this is would be a licensed agent who would make an opinion based on a property and it would be less thorough than an appraisal but more thorough than, um, a, B, than a CMA. 
then we have the appraisal. This is what everybody is has come to be uh, very. Uh, how do I say this? Very um, familiar with in our business, and this is kind of what drives everything. Thing we do right whether we're buying a property or selling a property we're, we're always waiting on that appraisal we need, need to know how the financing is going to take place and that's what's uh, what's important so as we go through this presentation we learn just a little bit more about how an appraisal takes place that'll help us as investors when we're valuing property and and we'll get into some of those details Oops. the last one is comps and really what all of these different types of ways of valuing property have in common is that they're, they use comps to do so, whether it's a valuation model or an appraisal, you're using comps or comparable properties to come up with the value of the property. But the key to victory in comps is actually picking good comps, and that's some of the things we'll help you with today. So that automated valuation model, this is uh, real straightforward. This is like your Zillow, AOL real estate used to be one, which actually was pretty accurate. Uh, even like Redfin and, and some of the others, ePraisal, um, you can use Realtor.com. Home gain. There's, these are different sites where you can basically go to the website, punch in an address, and it'll tell you what the property is worth. A lot of times this is confusing for folks because they say, "Oh, I put it into Zillow and it said the the, the value is two hundred thousand, and that's without it even being fixed up." Well, I'd like to share with you that uh, Zillow doesn't know if the house is fixed up or not. Simply, what it's doing is taking a taking a basically an average or taking the other properties around and coming up with the value based on uh, what other houses around are selling for. They don't actually know the value the value of the specific property, the condition, or whether it's been updated or not. So keep in mind that this is just kind of a barometer. Some of these websites can be accurate. Some of them might not be accurate at all, but the good uh, it's a good thing to use or just a tool to kind of get an idea of what you think values are for a property. I really like Redfin. I use this uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's not in every market, but it's in most markets. And the way that uh, it's, you know, just like Zillow or anything else, you can make a, an account. But one of the great things about Redfin is you can, like, favorite properties. You can get updates. You can actually go, if you go on the website version, uh, or excuse me, on the mobile site, you can actually draw, uh, you know, with a, a pen the area uh, that you're interested in seeing properties. So when I'm doing a deal, what I'll do is set kind of a parameter of that neighborhood so that I get updated every time a house in that neighborhood hits the market so I can see the condition, the value, and that type of deal. Um, I've got a couple of areas where I own a handful of rental properties and what I do there is same thing as I set up the parameters there just to get an idea of what properties in that area are selling for and so using that we can get a, a good idea of you know what the properties are worth in, in case you were looking to, to sell something. So I think it's a great tool. Um, the other cool thing is if you're driving around you can set the location deal so you see a house for sale, you could pull up your Redfin app and more or less immediately it would um, show you the closest house that was for sale. You could look at the pictures, that kind of stuff. So the other cool thing is that you can actually uh, set your search parameters so that you can only see sold properties within, you know, one, three, six months, whatever. So you can actually pull sold comps uh, and get a good idea of what the value of your, your property might be. So it's a, it's a good tool for that. Uh, when you're using comps, we, we have to know what to look for. We continue to talk about what a good comp is, and so let's talk about what that is. You're going to want it to be in the same area. You're going to want the properties to be similar, so this would be comparing ranches to ranches, by levels to by levels, two stories to two, two stories, etc. Uh, you can have size, style, and age, and we're going to get into more detail on each of these. Size, you're typically going to want to be within 20% of the total finished square footage. So if you were comping a house that was 2,000 square feet, or let's make the math simpler, if it was 1,000 square feet, your comps would range from 20% down, 800 square feet, to 20% above, 1,200 square feet. So it's a good tool to make sure you're not comparing 5,000 square foot properties with you know, 1,200 square foot properties. The style, apples to apples, you know, whether uh, we talked earlier, the ranch, the bi-level, uh, is a horse property, is it on a busy road, that kind of stuff. Age, age is almost always similar for the area. Of course, now we have a lot. A lot of areas where there's a lot of new construction or infill construction taking place, so we can't compare uh, one of those projects I showed you previously with a single-family house in that neighborhood that's 100 years old. Uh, just too different, so we want to make sure that we're in a similar age range. So when we talk about being in the same area, a uh, half mile is pretty typical. If you can get to a quarter mile, it's even better, but a half mile is kind of the standard for appraisals uh, as far as how 
or someone would be, how far a property could be. But we want to be very careful not to cross boundaries, and boundaries could be uh, a busy road, a highway, a hard and fast um, divider, uh, maybe a, where the school district changes, and this time of stuff may not always be super obvious, but we need to look at that. So, um, for just as an example, in our Denver market, if uh, we're I-25 and I-70 meet, you could be less than a half mile uh, be on the north and east side of that intersection and be in you know one of the least expensive areas in all of Denver, or you could be on the south and west side of that intersection and be in one of the most expensive areas in Denver, and they could be within just a half mile of each other. But what we have to note there is that we wouldn't cross a highway to find uh, comparable properties. So just make sure you're looking at your boundaries. Sometimes uh, wholesalers or people who are really trying to show value will find them crossing over boundaries that shouldn't be crossed over just to try to show that value. You want to make sure we're, we're in the same area. Similar size, age, and, and condition, or um, style, we talked about that, similar condition. We're getting into more detail on this, recently sold, under contract, and, and uh, uh, current listings. So this is what you're looking for in your comps to kind of build a complete package. Now we'll get into a little bit more detail uh, on each. So this one here is to show, um, let me just a sec here, to show location. So this uh, is a map in uh, in Denver. Uh, to the right you can see City Park and, and where the Denver Zoo is. Uh, it, basically to familiarize yourself, if you were uh, set South and west of here, you'd be in downtown Denver. And this was a property that we funded, and the subject is up here uh, at the top in the red, um, the red outline. The other properties, as you can see, they get further south, um, and in this area, further south would be more desirable. Further north uh, gets to be a, a tad bit more rough. In fact, uh, right here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but just north of the property is MLK. Properties north of MLK sell for less than, noticeably less than, properties south of MLK. And so this property we, is up here. So we say, well, why do we pull these comps from what, what I'm describing to you as more desirable areas? They're closer to the park. They're closer to downtown. They're closer to better uh, areas. Well, this house right here was an infill lot, so it was a new construction project. So we had to find new construction comps. There weren't any new construction comps north of MLK or in the area nearby. Uh, you see the closest one is a couple blocks away. Uh, just south of it, so we had to find other new construction projects, and that took us away from uh, kind of our core area. Even though the furthest comp is uh, less than a mile away, it, you have to ask yourself, is it a great comp? Well, in this appraisal, they made an adjustment for the area uh, because those areas are more desirable. So this isn't a great example of where you should be. This next shot that I'll show you is from uh, Minnesota in the Twin Cities area, and you can see on the left side uh, the Mississippi River. This is more typical of what you would expect. You can see that the subject is in red. The comps are all the way around it, surrounding the property. So, uh, you know, the furthest one being less than a mile away, but within the same uh, hard and fast boundaries. We didn't cross the Mississippi River uh, or the highway. You will see that we cross Central Avenue uh, to the right of the subject property, but important to note that in this area, Central's not busy enough to be the hard and fast boundary, considering we have. Uh, four other comps, uh, five other comps to the, to the west side or the same side as Central Avenue. So this is what you would typically see. You know, the property the subject is right in the middle of the comparables, so you know you're kind of getting a good feel from, from all directions. The next shot I'm going to show you is from Colorado Springs, and this one was interesting because it was a, a deal that we financed uh, on A up there at the top, and uh, they were wanted to use the comp that was down there at B. Now it's less than three quarters of a mile away, so it falls within the mile. And in this area, the house was the same exact size, same exact bedrooms, baths, uh, garage bays, lot size, etc. So they were really close together, and the houses were very similar. But the biggest difference was the age, and the subject property was uh, about 75 years old at A, and, and B was a brand new construction property. So just because we're within our boundaries and, are, and similar size and style and all of that, we have to be conscious of the age, and it's important to, to note when you're valuing a property. So let's talk about the different styles of property. Uh, I would ask, what is the most desirable floor plan? And uh, a lot of people would say ranch. Ranch is the most desirable floor plan. It has the biggest buyer's pool. Uh, elderly folk who don't want any stairs could buy it. Somebody with the family uh, could buy it, the single person, whatever. Uh, it has a very broad uh, range of people who would buy a ranch, so some would say that's the most desirable. 
uh, race ranch is basically looks like a ranch, but there's four or five steps you take to get into the front door. The the basement, if the, if it's finished, um, the windows are typically at what we would call garden level, where they're you know kind of like half light. So it'd be a race ranch. The two story, this is you know pretty obvious. You have two story. We have two story with a basement. Um, bedrooms typically upstairs, sometimes main floor, master kitchen, living on the main floor, and then in the basement below. A split level, this would be considered like a tri-level, you know, where you might go in on one level where the kitchen and living room is, you'd go upstairs to the bedrooms, uh, downstairs to the living area, sometimes a tri-level with a basement where you'd go down again from that level. I'm actually selling one of those right now as our personal residence for, for six years and we're just getting ready to sell it. Um, you know, it was, it was good for us, but once we had kids, there's just a lot of stairs running around. By level, this is the type of house where you walk in the front door and immediately you go up or down. Upstairs, typically kitchen, living, some di uh, some bedrooms. Downstairs, kind of a basement, bath, uh, and maybe a couple of bedrooms. Um, most people would say this is the least preferred style of home, and I think that becomes pretty obvious in the fact that nobody builds them anymore. So my, that might also be true with the tri level. Um, it's it's not extremely functional. Uh, you have to go. There's a lot of stairs. You have to decide. You go in. You go up. You go down. Um, so maybe not the most desirable. Uh, so, but when you're doing deals, you need to when you're comparing other properties, we need to compare as closely as we can. So that's why that's important to identify which each one is. If a buy level is less desirable than a uh, ranch property, then we probably shouldn't be comparing them to each other. Or if we do, we need to make an adjustment for that. Similar condition. This is this is easier to find now, I think, than, than it's ever been. Well, let's talk about the different types of condition. You have flipped, right? Flipped to me is is everything's new. New kitchen, bathrooms, walls, floors, window, roof, landscaping. This is a, a full flip. This is one where you go in and you're doing everything. Uh, and you know, basically one step short of, of the house being new. You're doing a lot of the work to it. Maybe upgrading systems, HVAC, etc. We call lipstick. This might be like a like a rental rehab or something. So you're going to go in, you're going to paint, carpet, uh, maybe you replace the counters but not the cabinets. Maybe you don't replace the the bathrooms. You're doing just enough to try to get this property to the next uh, next level, but without doing a, a full on rehab on it. Uh, we have lived in, and this is going to be you know someone's house that, that they lived in over time. Maybe they made some small updates. Uh, this is important when you're comping properties because. If the house uh, that sold four doors down was lived in, and you're going to do a forty thousand dollar renovation, how much more is your property worth? Sometimes that's, that's hard to measure, but you, we could make an adjustment of five or eight percent or something like that to show that the flipped house would be worth more than um, than the lived in property. Sometimes the lived in property will have some small updates like appliances or cabinets or counters or something like that, but the bones or the core of the house is pretty much original. And then we have rental, and this is you know kind of an idea if we're comparing these on the on the MLS or something, or or trying to find our comps. And I just say let's be honest, you know most rental properties aren't in the greatest shape when they trade hands or the tenants leave. So uh, make sure that when we're pulling comps, we're not comparing what is going to be our flipped property to rental condition. Now on that same token, let's make sure that when our tenant leaves the house that they've been living in for six years, and we're getting ready to just put that house on the market, that we're not using flipped comps. To come up with our value and make sure that we understand the exact differences here so that uh, we know how to price our property. Recent comps. This is uh, really important and it's actually even more important now than it had been in the past. And the reason I say that is because a lot of markets are coming up in value so quickly that if we're using comps that are a year old, our value could be off by 8, 10, 12 percent in some areas. So we want to make sure that we're using solid comps. It's typical to get three or four sold comps within six months. So if you're building your CMA or, or your package for the lender, or you're coming up with after repaired value for yourself, you want to find three or four comps that sold within the last six months. In today's market, you'd be better to, in, in some markets, you'd be better within three months so that you know uh, how much that property is trading for right now. If you go too far in the past, you might be cheating yourself on value a little bit and you just want to make sure you, you uh, pay attention to that. But also right now, six months ago would have been like, um, August, right? So houses could have been trading for more in August than they are in January. So you want to maybe identify the seasonality too if your comps go too far back. Under contract, it's good to have one or two under contract comps because what this tells you is what's happening right now. Uh, let's say your house hits the market at 365, you had 10 showings and you got an offer at, at 370 on, on day two that you accepted. If you're looking at the under contract comps, you'll know that that house was only on the market for two days uh, or however that time was, 
so based on the value, you have a real good idea if that was priced correctly. If you see a house that's under contract that it took 45, 60, or you know, 90 days to go under contract, you might know that there was either an issue with the property, the condition, uh, or the pricing, and or you see a couple price drops. So this kind of scans you a pulse on what's happening right now. The other thing is that these under contract comps today likely become your sold comps when you put your property back on the market. So it's important to understand kind of uh, what the expectation is to hit set price point. Current listings, uh, you want to see what's available today. So what's your competition? You're, you're closing on the ugly house today. What else is over there that's for sale? And with this, you can also get an idea of the fit, fit and finish that you're going to need to hit a, a certain price point. If you could get inside the properties, even better. You know, uh, back before, I guess before the Redfin and all these other um, type of websites, we would actually have to set showings at our competitors' properties and go look at them to get an idea of how good of a finish they did uh, if it wasn't clear from the pictures and rehab to that. But now, you know, there's so many sites where we can see the pictures or your agent can provide it to you and the pictures are so much clearer and better now if they hired a professional that you could get a really, really good idea of the, the condition of that property without having to visit it. Um, and I'd suggest that you do that just to know exactly what's going on. So we talk about the different conditions. Well, what happens? There's there's different ratings and different uh, definitions. And what I use, what I where I pull this from, is more or less from an appraisal. And these are the different conditions that an appraiser is going to use. So C1 is not previously occupied. This is new new construction, brand new. Toilets never been used. Um, you know, everything's brand new, and it's it's a brand new house. So this is the best condition you can have. You can never achieve this even if you did a full rehab or something or did a, a pop top or something on an appraisal you're not going to uh, reach C1 because the property had been lived in previously. The next one would be recently completed. This would be a flip as we just showed on the on two slides ago. This would be what a flip property would be. So when you finish your flip you should be getting to a C2 if you did a full renovation. A C3 would be kind of that uh, lipstick uh, or even um, a house that somebody lived in and made some small changes to over time. So this is kind of the middle of the row. It's a nice house, but it's it's not over the top. There's not these great grand uh, improvements that were made over time that would increase the value of the home uh, past kind of what the baseline is. C4 would be some minor deferred maintenance. This might be the gutters are leaking, the roof's roughed up, the yard's in tough shape, the you know windows are boarded, the, the kitchen's destroyed, whatever it might be. C5 is obvious deferred maintenance. This is even worse than the C4 we described. And C6 uh, is substantial damage uh, or deferred maintenance. So it could even be like structural or something like that. So in, the, in our business as fix and flippers or investors, buy and hold whatever it might be, our goal is to buy these C456 properties and turn them into C2 and 3 properties or what we're doing most recently is taking 5 and 6, scraping it and building a C1 or a brand new property on that lot. So uh, this is our business. We, we want to get these properties down here at the bottom and rehab them up to the top and make sure there's enough room to make money in the deal. And so that's that's what we do. Important to understand these different conditions. This is where it's important to, to know on your appraisal. If you get an appraisal in and you didn't hit your value, you might want to look at two things. Condition and quality are two things that are measured, and that's typically where adjustments will be made for the value of the property. And I'll show you that in a little bit more detail later, but uh, I had an appraisal I had to rebut one time because of the condition they were giving me compared to some of the other properties, and I had to say, well, look at this. You know, the, Here's the interior pictures. How much better is this property than my property? We ended up getting a better value on it. Uh, it was for a refinance, but uh, if you don't understand how to make those arguments, you're never going to, to uh, be successful in making said argument. So how do you make that adjustment? What is it? Now here's a handy Manny. We have our, our C5 and 6 on the left and maybe a C2 on the, on the right. So it could be made one of two ways. Sometimes it's a dollar amount and, and both of these are so arbitrary but the appraiser makes a, an adjustment. This house is X number of dollars better than the other house. Well, How do we measure that? How do we understand what the uh, dollars that would go into that. I mean, let's say, for instance, uh, this house is $40,000 nicer than the other house, but what's it going to take to get it there? I mean, we're probably talking fifty dollars or $60,000 in renovations to get a $40,000 adjustment. That's why we have to buy at such a deep discount. And a lot of times you'll see studies or articles that say uh, this rehab or this 
project in your house, a kitchen or a bathroom, for instance, will return you X percentage on your dollars. You know, some of them are in the low 20s, 30s, but a kitchen or bathroom typically is is above 80% uh, return because that's what sells houses. That's what people are looking for. It could be a percentage of the value. If the house is worth 300,000, but uh, it's it's beat up or whatever, it's not as nice as the one you're going to have. You just have a percentage adjustment. Let's say it's 10%. It's $30,000. Those adjustments are typically closer to 5%, sometimes 5% per category. So if you're comparing a C2 to say a C4, you might have a 5% adjustment per category, which would create a 10% adjustment. Or if you're only one category off C2 to C3, it'd just be a 5% adjustment. That's pretty typical uh, when we're looking at appraisals. I'm not seeing any questions coming in. Uh, if there's something we cover that, that you'd like to, to talk about, um, shoot a question in there, and then when we get to a, a stopping point here, we'll, we'll answer some of those questions. Actually, we'll answer questions after the square footage adjustment, because this one can, can be a little difficult to understand, but we'll spend some time on it. So, the square footage adjustment is probably one of the most important adjustments that most people don't understand how to make, and we need to talk about that. So, square footage adjustments are not equal to the price per square foot. So, what I'm trying to, to share with you here is that if you have a thousand square foot house that sells for a hundred thousand dollars, that makes it what a hundred dollars uh, per square foot is is what you're buying it for, and so that doesn't mean that for a hundred dollars uh, a foot that we could then just take okay, well these houses trade for a hundred bucks a foot, and then go to a twelve hundred square foot house and times it by that same hundred dollars a foot, and for two hundred additional square feet the house is worth $20,000 more. So what sometimes people say was well, the houses in this neighborhood trade for X number of dollars per square foot. So they say, well, they sell for 250, so I'm just gonna take the total square footage and times it by 250, that'll give me a sales price. That's, that's not gonna be accurate because the comps, um, the adjustments just won't be made that way. We'll, we'll go into how they do that. Quality comps, as we covered earlier, will be within 20% of the finished square footage. So going back to our example previously, a thousand square foot house, your comps are going to range from 800 to 1200 square feet uh, to stay within that 20%. The above grade square footage is more valuable than the below grade square footage. Let me show you uh, in an appraisal example here. So this might be a little tough to follow because I don't know if you guys can actually see uh, my mouse or not, so I'll just try to explain it to you uh, as in detail as I can. So in this uh, appraisal, if we look in the column uh, where at the top it says 0.58 miles, and we scroll down to the square footage, which is about uh, two-thirds of the way down, on the left side it says above grade room count gross living area. So in this example, the, 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 30, the adjustment here is $3,225. The subject property is 846 square feet. The comp is 975 square feet. So this difference, which we'll show you on the next slide, totals 3225 the adjustment. If we look down here on the bottom, they tell us what the adjustments are. It's $25 per square foot for GLA, which is gross living area. So this adjustment right here is the difference between the square footage times $25. The basement is worth $10 a square foot. And what they do is they'll give you $10 a square foot if your basement's bigger, and then they'll give you another $10 a square foot if the basement's finished. Um, so let me, let me show you on this next slide exactly how that shakes out. So in comp one, the subject was 846 square feet. Uh, uh, comp one's 975, so our difference is 129 square feet. I showed you that they used $25 a square foot as the multiplier. So when we so when we take that 129 times $25 a foot, we get 3,225. That's how we came up with that adjustment. So it adjusts down 3225. So our subject property is being adjusted down by comp one by $3,225. So it's worth that much less than. We're just gonna go back to the spreadsheet or the, the appraisal screenshot for just a second to show you that we're gonna go to comp two, which will be the one at the top says 0.85 miles away. We come down and we see the adjustment. This house is actually smaller than the subject property. So we're just going to do the same math, that square footage difference times $25 a square foot. So we take our subject of 
846 square feet. The comp is 705 square feet, difference of 141. We times it by $25 a foot. So now this comp, this, uh, comp adjusts up 35.25 to come to our end value. What I want to show you on this, because this could be confusing to people that maybe haven't done this before, is when we're doing an appraisal, the goal here is to make the adjustments in the property to make the to reconcile the end value. So, in this this isn't the, the best example because they're limited um, adjustments, but in comp one, which we covered here, is the, is the second one in or the first one in. The adjustments are down 3225, the next line down 6400, and then up 4000 square feet. So it's going down because it's bigger, it's going down because there's more finished square footage in the basement, and then it's going up because um, the subject has a bathroom, they're going to put a bedroom and a bathroom down there. Um, where the where the subject only has a rec room or whatever it might be. So you can see that these adjustments happen and we're trying to reconcile to an end value by adjusting these comps up and down. This one here uh, is another example of this. And so this was that new construction deal that I showed you that first screenshot on. And this is what, what we'll see here is that the gross living area, 1899, and comp one is 2,400 square feet. So based on what I told you, this isn't the best comp because it's just outside of that 20% range. Comp 2 is 2,180, so it's closer, and we're seeing these pretty large adjustments, 20,000, 11,000. This is because this is a much higher price point house. The last one was about a $130,000 house. This one's above 500,000, so the adjustment per, per square footage is, is larger, which makes the, the property values uh, significantly different. This one also was interesting because they, they did an a accessory unit or a carriage house above the garage. And so the other challenge was to find comps that had carriage houses. None of these three did, but the next set of comps did, or the next page. So they she gave a value of the carriage house 15000 It's such an arbitrary thing. A carriage house or accessory unit, for those of you who don't know, they, this was a new construction house. They built a two-car garage in the back. And what the zoning allowed them to do was then build an apartment on top of that garage in the back, you know, 400 square feet. Uh, it was like a studio, so you know, not really a bedroom, but had a bathroom, kitchen, etc. So somebody um, could live up there. You could rent it out. Now, for some people, they think, "Oh, that's great! You have an adult uh, or a kid that maybe is at college and come back and live there. You could stick the kids out there. You could use it as a home office. You could rent it to somebody to create a little bit of extra income." Some people say, "Great! I'd love to have that." Other people, probably nobody on this. Uh, webinar would say I don't want that I don't care for that I, you know that's just extra room or whatever for me to take care of I'm paying for finished square footage I can't use so the value of 15,000 somewhat arbitrary um, it just kinda helps us reconcile an end value but I don't know how you accurately um, account for that just because there's so many different uses so the, the square footage adjustments you're probably wondering well how do we get there you, you come up with these different numbers 25 the other ones higher 45 the adjustments are depend on the price point. So, at a lower price point, say under about 150,000, your square footage adjustments going to be about 25 bucks a foot. As you get higher in value, like the one we just showed you, closer to 45 or 50 bucks a foot, you're going to have a, a bigger adjustment. So, under 150, you're probably about 25 bucks a foot. 150 to 200, you're probably about 30 bucks a foot. Uh, 200 to 250, you're about 35 bucks a foot. And you can see that it kind of ratchets up because the higher price point will have a higher value per square foot. So we don't just use the square footage of the house divided by the what it's going to sell for because what we're doing now is uh, more or less adjusting the marginal square foot between square footage between two properties. The below grade uh, or basement square footage it Typically on appraisal, you're going to get $10 per square foot of unfinished, regardless of the price point. You get, if, you, if the basement is there, you get $10 a foot for it. If the basement's finished, you get 10 and this is 10 to 25 but you might even get up to 40 bucks a foot if it's finished really nice. What I'd like to challenge people to do when I give this presentation is, um, you, we've all seen the basements of, of houses that were built in the 60s, 70s, whatever. Some of them are better than others. Go out and look at some new construction houses and look at how the basements are finished. They often have 9 or 10 foot ceilings. 
big egress windows, lots of natural light, finished really well. So if you were at a blindfold law and you went down to the basement, you know, I guess that's kind of the beginning of a weird story, but what I'm saying is if you got down into a basement and you know open your eyes, you may not know what, what floor you're on it, the way that they're finished now. Some of them, of course, you could have a theater room, you could have a wet bar, game rooms, uh, bedrooms, bathrooms, etc. So they're, they're much more functional square footage now than they had been in the past, and for that you're going to get a higher adjustment. But what I'd like to share with you here too is that it often for investors doesn't make sense to finish the basements. I just told you you get 10 bucks if the basement's there, but maybe only another 10 or 15 on a lower price point if you finish a basement. How much does it cost to finish a basement? And you're at least $25 a foot, probably closer to about $40 a square foot right now to finish a basement with uh, plumbing, bathroom, uh, etc. So with that, it typically doesn't make sense for investors to finish basements, but it might make a house more marketable. If you're in a neighborhood where it's a 2-1 upstairs and you can make it a 2-1 downstairs and give yourself a 4-2, uh, that might sell faster, but you're never going to recoup the full amount of that basement finish. I was buying rental properties pretty heavy, uh, single family houses. I was often finishing the basements because I needed more bedrooms so I could collect more rent, um, not necessarily to increase the value of the house, but to give myself an opportunity to collect more rent. High quality finishes get the best adjustments that we were just talking about in the newer houses. Really nice finishes get better, adju better adjustments. Before we get into bedrooms, I'm going to answer uh, a couple of questions here. So one of the questions was, uh, can you read? Repeat the adjustment percentages for the conditions. Yeah, so basically what I was telling you is for uh, a three, it's it could be as much as 5% per condition. So if you're comparing a C2 to a C3, it might be 5%. If you're comparing a C2 to a C4, because you're going two levels, uh, you might get an additional 5%, so now you have a 10% adjustment. It's uncommon to be comparing C2 properties to C5 or 6 properties. Why? Because the condition is so different that it wouldn't make it a good comp. So you would use a better comp and uh, potentially have a lower um, adjustment for condition because you don't want to use uh, a bad comps. Any other questions out there that somebody wants to, to punch in real quick before we go on to bedrooms? All right, we're going to jump ahead, and if any other questions come up, we'll, uh, we'll go to a stopping point and cover it. So bedrooms, what's a bedroom worth? I like to ask this question, what's a bedroom worth? And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So a bedroom isn't worth anything. And, you know, a lot of times somebody says, well, well my, my house is three bedrooms and there's only two, or mine's five or six bedrooms and there's only three. The bedroom doesn't have a value associated with it. You don't see on an appraisal an adjustment for uh, a bedroom. What you do see is a adjustment for the square footage like I just showed you. So if you had a house that was 1,000 square feet and had 10 bedrooms on one level, that doesn't make it worth more than a 1,000 square foot house that has two bedrooms on that level because 10 bedrooms wouldn't be functional. But what's the difference between a two-bedroom and a three-bedroom? It's made in the square footage. Typically, three-bedroom houses are going to be bigger than two-bedroom houses, so you would get that adjustment in the square footage. The only place I would uh, argue that it doesn't uh, work that way would be in the difference between a one-bedroom and a two-bedroom. The buyer's pool, the renter's pool, the everything uh, is much bigger in a two-bedroom than in a one-bedroom. So there would be a significant price difference uh, between a one-bedroom uh, property and two-bedroom property. What's significant depends on the price point. If we're talking about a hundred thousand dollar house, I mean, it might be ten thousand or something like that. If we're talking about a higher price property, um, it would likely be a, a bigger adjustment than that. Um, and then, uh, oops, here we go. The difference between one and two bedrooms. We just covered that. So basements and bathrooms. Let's talk about that a little bit. Double the size of the house, but not the value. We, we covered how the square footage adjustments are so much less for below grade square footage. So sometimes it's hard to think if you had a, a thousand square foot ranch all above grade, that a thousand square foot ranch with a basement, which is double the square footage, it's not worth twice as much. In fact, that house with a basement might only sell for, um, it could be as, as much as 25% um, if you got 10 bucks for the square footage and another 25 for the finish, or excuse me, 10 for the Square footage, 15 for the finish. Now you got 20 additional $25 a foot over a thousand. You know, they're $25,000. So you might get that much, but uh, twice the size, but not twice the uh, value of the house. 
often a break even for finishing or a losing proposition. As I mentioned earlier, it makes the house more marketable, but it doesn't necessarily more, mean more valuable. What I mean by that is that somebody who walks in your house would love to buy a, a, a house that has a finished basement with a couple of extra bedrooms and bathrooms for their family, but that doesn't mean that that is going to cross over into the appraisal. So if you're in a hard money loan, you decide to finish the basement, your house might sell faster at a little bit higher price point, but I don't know that the cash on cash is going to make the difference. Uh, bathrooms typically add between 1500 and 5000 in value. The difference between one bathroom and two bathrooms would be about $5,000 in value at most price points. But how much does it cost to put in a bathroom? If you're slab on grade, you might spend every bit of $8,000 to put in a bathroom that's going to yield you a $5,000 return. But going back to what we just covered in, in uh, basements, is a 3-2 much more attractive than a 3-1? Absolutely. So you might sell it faster, maybe at a, little, uh, a higher price point, but it's going to be tough to recoup the, the whole amount. If you're talking about the difference of bathrooms between, say, 3 and 4, you might get 1500 bucks for a powder bath uh, or even a 3 quarter, but it's going to cost a lot more than that to actually put it in. Uh, diminishing return, the difference between one, like I said, between one and two significant, five and six is, is pretty low. So uh, that helps you to understand, you know, should I put in a bathroom in this house? Well, is it going to sell faster? Is it going to change the functionality of the house? Um, or are you going to be spending money you can't recoup? Before we jump into location adjust, uh, adjustments, we have a, a few questions here that I just want to jump in and, and answer. Uh, somebody says, can you put a uh, bathroom in the basement and now you have an extra bathroom, so... Uh, the value would go up. We just covered that. Uh, this question came in before that. So, uh, yeah, there would be a little bit more value for it, but the cost of putting a, a bathroom in a basement, when you have to cut up the floor and do all that, put in the plumbing, it, it's going to cost a lot of money so that you're not going to be able to recoup as much. Um, somebody said, is Zillow prices home better than Zestimate? Yes, because what you can use on, uh, if we're talking about the same thing, price is home. Like I just did this on, on my house. I was sitting there on the couch one day. If you pull up Zillow and you actually log in and you change the specific things on the house, windows updated, bedroom, bathrooms, window coverings, you do the whole thing, it'll give you a much more accurate value of your house. I still would use Zillow as a barometer and not the rule. I would use websites to give me true sold comps. I haven't been on Zillow enough to know, but maybe uh, there's an opportunity that that would work. Um, I have another a couple of people asking about dividing the uh, price per square foot by a certain number. This is something that we sometimes teach in the class. Uh, it's challenging to do on a webinar, but I'll do my best. So I told you that um, you would use that square footage adjustment. Well, how do you get to that square footage adjustment? Sometimes what we do for an appraisal is you'll take uh, the price per square foot. Let's say it's selling for $200 a foot and you would divide that by somewhere between four and five, say if we use four, 200 bucks a foot divided by four gives you $50 a foot. Now you can use that $50 a foot to make your square footage adjustment. So we're looking at that, how much, what's um, $150,000 house trades for say 25 bucks a foot. That's kind of how you would get there. Uh, someone asked about walkout basements. This is interesting about walkout basements. The only person that cares how much a walkout basement costs would be the person who paid for that lot when the house was built. A walkout basement typically adds fifteen to twenty-five hundred dollars for being a walkout basement, and sometimes an additional five to ten dollars per square foot for the basement being a walkout if the two sides have enough grade that there's a lot of natural light. So you're not above grade; you're still below grade, but. Uh, if you go to a new builder and say how much for this walkout lot, it's going to be like $35,000 and you'll never recoup that um, on the resale of a property. Uh, but for valuing it, it's not significant. Maybe $2,500 for the fact that it is walkout, maybe 5 bucks a foot. So if you had a 1,000 square foot basement, that would yield about $7,500. So it's not a, a huge amount of money. Okay, so let's go on to uh, square footage uh, adjustments here, or excuse me, location adjustments. This is interesting because what we're seeing in a lot of markets right now is the kind of the houses that are left, if you will, are, are kind of the, the, the crappy houses. So they're on busy streets or back into commercial or different things like that. And what we want to do as investors, we want to use comps that are in the area close to where it is uh, to try to make that value. In a lot of neighborhoods, especially some here in Denver, to be on that 
major street versus two or three blocks in could be a fifty, sixty, hundred thousand dollar difference. If the road's busy but it's in a hip area, you gotta ask yourself, where would you rather be? So close to commercial, industrial, schools, busy roads, uh, railroad crossings, all this stuff affects the value. So I'm gonna show you a screenshot here from an appraisal. Uh, as you see up in the top left corner, there's double red lines, those are train tracks. You'll see where the A is, that's a subject property. What's in the box here just below the subject property is an elementary school. And over to the right side, you'll see what is like a shipping depot or semis are, are coming and going all day. So the house that we were funding was, uh, the subject property was right there where the A is. There wasn't an adjustment for the location of the property. I called the appraiser and I asked him, hey, you know, I got this appraisal, thanks for sending it over. I'm a little confused because there's no adjustment for the location of this property. He says to me, oh, in that neighborhood, you'd much rather look at the school than any of the neighboring houses. I thought, oh, that's interesting. Needless to say, we don't work with that appraiser anymore. But ask yourself, if you're buying or selling the subject property right here on A, who wants to buy that house? Well, if it's a, a young parent with two elementary school age kids, they might love that location because they could just send the kids right over to school. If it was an elderly couple or somebody who didn't have kids or the kids were gone, the last thing they want to do is live across from the parking lot of an elementary school. Buses are coming and going, people are coming and going, uh, you know, the hug and, hug and go lanes like pretty much in front of your house. So what if uh, we weren't at A but we were a block over and a block up on Mechanic Ave here? That house maybe doesn't get an adjustment because it's, it's further from the school but still has the same other uh, interferences with the commercial and, and the train tracks. Anytime you're trying to figure out if there shouldn't be an adjustment for location, it's really simple. This is what you ask yourself. As you're standing there, you ask yourself, would a buyer rather be here or one block over? Or two blocks over, or three blocks over? If the answer is one, two, or three blocks over, there needs to be an adjustment for the value. This house sh isn't worth as much across from this uh, as it is um, a block in where it's a more residential or normal scene. Now let's say you're over here on Van Dyke and La Crosse uh, to, the, to the south and, and right or maybe east, whatever, of the school. You might want to live over here and be really close to the park uh, and have the opportunity to, to walk across the street to the park. So maybe that increases the value a little bit. Uh, but it's just important to note if you wouldn't, if you prefer a different property, there has to be an adjustment in value. Here's another house. This one that we funded in Denver and ultimately owned. Uh, this is Quebec and this is MLK. Super busy street. Uh, this house right here is the first one where you can actually park in front of the property. So the first two you can't. Uh, first one, this corner right here um, where the park is. Some, some interesting characters hang out there. Sometimes there's shopping carts. Uh, look, but look at all the green pastures ahead and how much park and all this open space and stuff. This is basically a, a three-lane highway and then another three lanes over here. So uh, we have to make an adjustment for this. What is it? Well, starting point for location is typically 10%, could be as high as 15%. Ask yourself, would you rather be at the subject property right here on Quebec or one block in on Poplar? It changes everything. You can't even play catch in the front yard over here without uh, fear of getting hit by a bus if you overthrow your partner. The one thing I'll share with you here is this uh, intersection right here. There's a hotel here that has a, the, the best sandwich bar in Denver. So this is right at MLK in Quebec. So if you're ever in town, you should, you should check that out. Uh, somebody said I cut out when I made the adjustment. The typical adjustment is going to be 10% uh, as a starting point, up maybe even up to 15% for this. Uh, someone asked, what is the percentage you take off for a property on double yellow lines? It, it really depends. Uh, I mean, double yellow could be a residential street uh, near a school zone or something, so maybe it's nothing because it's, there's just maybe a tad bit more traffic through there, but it's not super busy. Uh, but if you're, you know, like outside of our office here where there's a double double yellow line and uh, it's a busy street, you got to kind of take an idea and say, okay, well, what's it look like? What's the difference here? Uh, and just make a value or just make a judgment on how busy that is. And, and make sure you don't just go at 11 o'clock in the middle of the week. Uh, you know, go on the weekend, visit the property, try to get a good idea because that's when your buyers are going to be looking at it. You want to know what the interferences are going to be when they're there. Uh, commercial space is another big one. We funded this house right here. Uh, I-70 is just below here. This is a, a Motel 6. You know, they leave the light on for you. Um, but this is just across I-70 from one of the hottest areas uh, in town. So maybe you can get your value because somebody's willing to deal with some of these uh, other things if they're close enough to the hot part of town where it's just a hop and a skip. 
this house actually sold for much more than we valued it for, uh, for two reasons. One, that market continued to go up really strong in that area, and two, they did a lot more rehab uh, to the property than uh, the than they initially said they were going to, so it turned out to be a good project for them. But again, ask yourself, who lives here? I mean, young professionals without kids or, or something like that, they're going to live across from the Motel 6. Maybe it's no big deal. You know, somebody with a family, maybe it's not as, as good of a place. Maybe you don't even care. Um, but don't tell me you can't hear the semi-truck coming down I-70 at 70 miles an hour uh, from your back porch right here. Although they tell me if you close your eyes, it'll sound like a river. So here's some, uh, we're going to answer a few more questions before we jump into the common mistakes. Uh, someone asked you, adjust in Minnesota for uh, water view and, and that kind of thing. Uh, yes, um, deeded access is worth the most. If you're on a lake and you have deeded access or deeded dock access, you, you, it's definitely worth more. But if you're just on the lake uh, or views, uh, the hope is that when you're pulling comps for other properties in that, that general vicinity that they're also going to have lake uh, characteristics or lake views or what it might be if they're on the lake. So. Uh, we definitely want to have a few more comps that are on that lake, and let's say most of the comps are not, or the most recent sales aren't on the lake. What we would need to do is maybe uh, go further back in time to figure out, okay, when did the last house sell on the lake, get a general idea of what the increase has been per year, let's say we go back 18 months, and make an adjustment for time uh, for that lake access. Or oftentimes in the Twin Cities, uh, the, if you're in an area with lakes, there will be a number of lakes nearby where you might be able to pull a comp off of another lake to get an idea of, of what that value is. But again, a uh, lake, great place to be. It's worth something different to everyone, so it, your end buyer has to be in for it. I mean, I don't swim that well, so I could really care less if I back to a lake. Um, in terms of appraised value, how is a lot size adjusted? Uh, Denver, is there a simple square footage that, that's used? So uh, actually, we're going to cover this right here, Rob, so we'll just uh, cover that one when we get there. Is there a reference to get uh, details and all the calculations and adjustments? Uh, give me a call, Brian. We, we could talk about a little bit more detail. Would being too far from, from uh, major roads uh, affect the value? Well, maybe. I mean, I guess it depends on what your explanation of, of major is. Um, if you're out in the suburbs but far from the highway, likelihood is that your comps are also going to be in that similar area, unless you're in like a rural area. But even then, your comps are going to have similar um, Similar, I lost my train of thought, but they're going to have similar, uh, I don't know what you call it, amenities, right? So they're all going to be a similar distance from said road. So as long as your comps are in your immediate area, it's not going to negatively affect you because you're not going to compare houses that are 15 miles out of downtown to, to houses that are in downtown. So I, I hope I help you out with that. Uh, somebody asked, would it make sense to build an addition on a, on a small house? Maybe. Uh, we see a lot of people make money doing that. Why? Because you can com confuse the appraisers. If you're uh, taking a neighborhood that's old, maybe a lot of two-bedroom, one-bath houses, and making them three-bedroom, two-bath by adding 400 square feet on the outside, and now you can chase a value that you could only get if you cross the railroad tracks, absolutely could be worth it. But you got to identify that. Just like anything we're doing, whether we're doing a big rehab or a little rehab, we have to identify if the dollars putting in uh, makes sense for the dollars coming out. Common valuation mistakes, tax value. This is a problem in an increasing market and a decreasing market. They say, oh, the tax value is $100,000, so this house must be worth about that. Well, typically in markets, the tax value um, is behind the actual value of the property by about 18 months, 18 months to two years, because they only do the appraisals every two years. So if you look at tax statements, which a lot of us are getting right now if you're in the uh, in the Denver area, uh, they're valuing your house significantly more than the last time you got it, but it's still less than it is uh, actually worth today. Or if the market's going down, we're looking at tax values as a hundred and a quarter, the house might only be worth a hundred thousand. So um, you can use it as a barometer, but certainly don't use it to value property. The last sold or listed price, you know, this was uh, back in 2010, you get a call and say, but in 2006 it sold for 800000 Yeah, well, everything sold for 800000 in 2006. That's why you have the opportunity to buy it today at a discount. So uh, make sure that we don't put a lot of weight on that. Um, just because it was listed for a million doesn't mean it was worth a million. Square footage adjustments, we beat that to death, but it's so important. Adjusting for bedrooms, remember we make that in the square footage adjustment. Location adjustments, you know, I bring this up even though we just covered it because it happens all the time. You have the house, it's in a, a bad location, but we tend to ignore it because we can't find any other deals. So we start to think, no, this is fine, this is fine. Traffic, railroad, commercial, industrial schools. 
uh, value in rental property. We'll cover this quickly because uh, a lot of it has to do with how you finance the property. And the reason I say that is because if you're using conventional financing, um, they don't. The value isn't. It doesn't matter uh, how much is rented for because they're using the comparable sales approach. Uh, if you're buying. Uh, a, a five unit, then they're going to use the income approach, and now all of a sudden um, the value makes a little bit more sense. So, how do we do this? Single family and two through four unit, you're using the comparable sales approach. So, what does that mean? You're using comps just like you would a house that you were uh, buying and selling to come up with the value uh, and not looking at rents. They do a rent schedule to give you an idea of what it'll rent for, but it doesn't affect the value. Five units or more, you're going to use the income approach. And what that means is you're going to take the income the asset produces minus the expenses to come up with a net operating income, and those properties typically trade on a cap rate. So uh, you're going to use the, the income is what creates it. So if you get your leases up, you get your expenses down, you increase the value of that property. Non-conforming property, is it less valuable, less marketable? Sure, less people can finance a non-conforming property. This might be um, a duplex that's on a single family lot or um, a house that has a carriage house built behind it that's grandfathered in or, or something like that, but nobody will, uh, maybe it's not grandfathered in, maybe it's against the code, but uh, the city's not too worried about it, but they won't, but you can't get somebody to finance it because it's, it's less valuable, or excuse me, less marketable because it doesn't fit code. So how, how do you finance it? Maybe with a local bank, cash, something like that. How do you value it? Can be challenging to value because if the whatever's on the property that's making it non-conforming, uh, it could be expensive to remove it or to uh, to fix it. Uh, this could even be something with uh, let's say a single-family house that had a basement. Somebody finished it as a little income property, and they have they put in separate entrances, but it's still zoned R1. Well, the, it's it's not to code, so it's non-conforming. You can't finance that with a Fannie Mae loan. Could you finance that with a local bank or or pay cash for it and have a great cash flowing property? Sure, you probably could, but yeah, it's it's more difficult to finance. They might exclude square footage. If you have a carriage house that's not permanent or not uh, grandfathered in it, the appraisal might exclude that little carriage house. They might exclude the income that comes from it or, or the whole building together, so you need to make sure that you understand that. Um, it could be a basement where the ceiling level is too low or an attic conversion where the ceiling level is too low. Okay, well, how do we make that adjustment? That's non-conforming space. For the right buyer, it's finished space, but that doesn't mean that, but you might not get that credit when you're trying to finance it or, or appraise it, rather. Here's some, some rules of thumb. Egress windows add more rental value than they do resale value. Um, I, I've never seen an adjustment on an appraisal for egress window. Now, a lot of times in flips, we put them in because that's what it takes to be a conforming bedroom, but you, and egress windows are going to be expensive now, too, maybe $3,500, $5,000 or something, depending on who you hire. Um, you're not going to get the money back. I like to put them in my rentals because now I have conforming bedrooms for Section 8 or that kind of thing so I can get more rent. Uh, you know, I'd like to know that if something happens in the middle of the night that people have a way out. What I would typically do when I was finishing the basement is not to put one in each bedroom, but I'd put one in the bedroom furthest from the stairs so that you had two uh, two egress points, two points to exit the property. You could put them in your flips, but it's going to be challenging to recover that cost. Now, remember, we talked about this multiple times, more marketable versus more valuable. The house might sell faster with an egress window, but it doesn't mean that um, it's more valuable with the egress window. The closer to the city you are, the higher the square footage adjustment should be. This is tr typically true for, for two reasons. The properties are typically smaller the closer you get to the city, and uh, they're more valuable the closer you get to the city. So the square footage adjustment will be higher than if you're way out in the suburbs. Largest house in the area uh, demands, excuse me, demands a smaller per square foot adjustment. This makes sense, right? Because if all the houses in the neighborhood are 1,000 square feet and you, you have 1,500 uh, or 2,000, you're going to be pulled down by those other comps in your value. Just like in the reverse, if you have the smallest house in the neighborhood, you're going to be pulled up by the comps. One thing I always like to use is aerial maps to look for uh, negative influences. So you, a wholesale deal hits your desk. First thing you do, put it in Google Maps because you only have to drive all the way across town and rush out of traffic once to show up to a property that has railroad tracks in the backyard to swear you that you'll never do that again. So make sure that um, you're spending just a little bit of time. Does the neighbor have cars in the backyard? Is it a busy street? Does it back to the highway? What is it? And identify that before you get in the car. 
In the main metro areas, uh, garages are a three to five thousand dollar adjustment. Um, if you're in a neighborhood where the difference between zero and one car garage, you're probably going to be closer to the five thousand dollar adjustment. If you're in a neighborhood where you're looking at the difference between a two car and three car garage, the return will be minimal, right? So it might only be twenty five hundred. So um, understand that. Look around the neighborhood. What do other people have? Do they have garages? Okay, what's that make my garage worth? Uh, it used to you used to almost break even to um, build garages. It costs about ten thousand dollars to build it. You get ten thousand dollars in value. The cost has come up, but the but the value hasn't come up. Uh, someone was asking about the the, tra the lot adjustments in um, say the city and county of Denver or the the metro area and planned subdivisions. It's not likely that you're going to get an adjustment for lot size. If you're in a neighborhood where all the lots are six thousand, you're on a corner lot and you got eight thousand square feet. Uh, that's not going to make it that much uh, more valuable. They might give you 50 cents or a dollar a square foot, which in that uh, in that example would be a 1,000 to 2,000 dollar adjustment. So it would you would it'd be so small you would never actually factor it into whether or not you would do the deal. It's so rare to see adjustments for lots. Now when you get into bigger areas. Um, like say for instance, uh, you get outside of town a little bit and you start to count acreage, absolutely there's going to be some adjustments for that. Sometimes in Denver, if, uh, if the house is on a half lot versus a full lot, which sometimes happens, there'll be an adjustment for that, uh, but it's not, it's not huge. Uh, go look at your competition, we covered that, get out there and see what people are doing. Um, in this slide here, I just wanted to, to just, uh, here's actually a lot adjustment right here, uh, since we were just covering it, the site, it's like the fifth line down. 10,000 square foot site versus 19,000, so it's twice the size. It's a 50 cent, I think it's, that equates to 50 cents or a quarter uh, per square foot, so it's pretty minimal. And this guy's got to take care of 9,000 more square feet. Right here, we see an adjustment for a bathroom. We have a 3 1 versus a 3 2, $6,000 adjustment for that bathroom. We have our square footage adjustment, which, which, which we covered. We have our basement adjustment down here. Fireplaces, fireplaces are alme, almost always one to two thousand dollars. Would cost you way more to put that in, but it's almost always one to two thousand uh, dollars adjustment. This one has one. This one has two. You get two grand. Fencing, uh, chain link fence, fifteen hundred. This one always makes me laugh. The fence adjustments because how much chain link fence could you put in for fifteen hundred bucks? Probably about thirty feet of it. So the idea that you only get, that you get such a small adjustment is interesting to me. But it kind of helps you understand um, different things the appraisers use to to settle on value, um, and you see the patio and deck adjustments there, the garage, all this different stuff. This one here, this might be difficult for you guys to read, but what I wanted to show you, and this is great for the person who asked about the walkout, um, he gave a little bit more value here. This was, a, I believe, a two hundred fifty thousand dollars house. Thirty thousand dollars of thirty dollars a foot for the gross uh, adjustment. The walkout's twenty five hundred bucks for the walkout plus fifteen dollars a foot for a finish square footage. They're giving you five thousand for a porch, twenty five hundred for a patio, two thousand for a fireplace, etc. This is just a part of the appraisal that if you say, "Wait a minute, why why didn't I get that?" You can go look at the details and get a, a good idea of um, how that should be. Okay, so now we've we've concluded the presentation. There's two questions in here. I'm going to answer those. If other people have questions, you can type them in. I'd be happy to answer them. You could also type in things like, "Hey, great job, Travis. Appreciate you putting it on the on the webinar." Uh, the question was, uh, carport versus one car garage. Carport, uh, one car garage is going to be about 2,500. Carport might be a thousand. Depends on how. Um, you know how nice it is, if you will. Does it have a steel roof? Does it have a uh, you know plastic? Is it shingled? Could it be finished, uh, etc. So that's important to to understand. Uh, the other question was how likely that you can be successful with the changes in a uh, an appraisal for the adjustments. I actually had a lot of luck with this. Um, I had an appraisal that I thought came in way too low, and I spoke with uh, the lender, this is a refinance on a conventional loan, and they had a specific process for how you would uh, basically rebut an appraisal. And because I understand the information that we covered today, what I was able to do was take the time and look at the appraisal and say, this is why this isn't a good appraisal. Here are X number of comps that are better, and this is why they're better. And I actually got the value up about $20,000 on that refinance. So the You'll be successful if you understand it. As appraisers, what we often, or investors, what we do is we get an appraisal, if it hits our value, we say, cool, we throw it away. If it doesn't hit our value, we get mad and we throw it away. We don't take the time to read it. 
So uh, I'm going to conclude the recording, but I'll, I'll stay on and answer some questions. I just want to thank everybody who st stuck around. If you have additional questions, you can type them in the comments, but I'd really encourage you to just reach out to me with the contact information here, the phone number, the email, and I'd love to help you as much as I can. Um, we can't maybe spend all day talking about it, but I would love to answer some questions and help you to, to grow your business. We put these webinars on once a month, and um, we're going to put this on uh, the YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and all that good stuff. Thanks, everyone, and have a great night.